the way that we think about the relationship between sex and gender is is relatively modern um and so but it is incredibly entrenched and it organizes sort of almost every facet of society so i think that this idea that there could be people who are something else or who are neither gender or both genders or you know another type of gender altogether people don't like it it messes with a kind of easy simplistic way in which they've always thought about um, those things hello and welcome to different conversations where every week we have a different academic from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, University of Westminster, talking to us about their work, what's different, what's interesting, and just what's going on right now. This week, I've got Francis Ray White. Francis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to be here. And it's great to have you. Uh, this is someone we've been trying to pin down for a bit, a little bit of emails back and forth, but we've got you now. And so... Uh, Maybe as a bit of a, a freebie intro, you could introduce yourself, uh, who you are, what your elevator pitch is for our audience. Um, yeah, so I um, teach here in the sociology department at Westminster. I've been here for ooh, 14 years now, um, and I teach a lot of modules on uh, gender and sexuality and the sociology of the body. Um, and so, yeah, my research interests are in those kinds of kinds of areas, and I've been pursuing various things. So I've got a longer history of writing about um, fat bodies. And I've been thinking about the intersections between fat bodies and trans transgender bodies. Um, and, and basically sort of how, how fat shapes gender in different kinds of ways. Um, I've also been working on a big ESRC project about trans pregnancy for the last few years, um, which is about to come to an end. Um, and I've also been doing some research about uh, non non-binary gender people in uh, higher education, so staff and and students, which is an ongoing research project as well. So I've got a few things on the go, <laughs> not you know less so right at the moment, but yeah. <laughs> I think uh, every time I talk to anybody for this podcast, it's always like, well, I do just a little bit here and there, and a few things, and it's this amazing list of stuff that keeps us busy, and somehow we we manage. Um, I'm not sure how sometimes, but I think it's uh, some of the work you talked about about um, binary concepts of gender, about uh, uh, trans people in higher education. That's actually why I wanted to have you today and have you for this podcast, and perhaps just to start off to educate me is on this topic area. People see gender as a binary thing in society, right? And that's a, a very common point of view, not the only, of course, but the most common one where you have males and you have females. And it's very binary. Uh, we're starting to challenge that idea. And people are struggling with this, I think. Why do you think that is? I mean, I think, I think you've answered your own question in the sense that people are struggling because we are so used to a binary system of gender, which we have hitched up to a kind of biological in some way understanding of of two dimorphic sexes and then that that organizes the whole of society and you know that in itself is a is a quite a western way of thinking it's it's a, the way that we think about the relationship between sex and gender is is relatively modern um and so but it is incredibly entrenched and it organizes sort of almost every facet of society. So I think that this idea that there could be people who are something else or who are neither gender or both genders or, you know, another type of gender altogether, people don't like it. It messes with a kind of easy, simplistic way in which they've always thought about um, those things. And, um, yeah, so I, th I mean, I think people struggle with new information all the time that comes in a framework that they're not familiar with. Um, so I think that at a basic level, it's that. I mean, I think there's more, you know, there's more to it in the sense that it, um, yeah, it threatens certainties. People don't like being able to know what somebody really is or, you know, those kinds of questions. So, yeah, I think there's a lot going on, but I think, you know, it's really interesting for me as a non-binary person, and I've been out for quite a long time now, so like nearly a decade, the shift that's happened even in the last 10 years in terms of um, 
people having some kind of understanding that there might be people who exist uh, who don't identify as male or female. Um, he, more kind of recognition of things like um, pro, gender neutral pronouns and increasingly recognition that perhaps we need some kind of legal um, endorsement of the, you know, or sort of uh, way in which you don't have to be um, male or female in a, in a kind of legal sense. So things like passports and that kind of thing, we're not there yet in this country, but there are other countries where they're starting to bring in that kind of legislation. So although, it, you know, there is progress, it, yeah, it's, um, uh, which is it's quite recent, it's very recent. And I think that um, there's a big gap between people's level of, of knowledge around this at the moment and their level of, of kind of um, fear in some senses, for sure, yeah. Mm. I think that there's so much in that um, that I want to unpack and there's about three or four different ways I want to take this and we'll see what I forget and what I remember. But I think even that towards the end, last point about legal representation, I didn't know this until I was preparing for this podcast to talk to you about this. That in the United Kingdom, legally, you can be a man or a woman, but in the eyes of the law, that's all you've got. And so for someone like yourself or a person who uses they and them as a pronoun, that must be a bit challenging, I'm guessing, to put that politely. <laughs> um, yes, I, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it, it just means that you feel like you are... <sighs> There's, you have to lie on forms you can't you know if you're not given the the option and then that you know assumptions continue to be made about you that are, are not correct and yeah it's just it is it, it it feels like there's no space for you to kind of exist officially and that is a very undermining uh, kind of feeling um yeah so it's I mean the thing is I think I mean this is what I was just saying about how it actually, you know, kind of recognition of it in a in a cultural way has really improved, and it's not great, but it's like something. Um, and you know, the 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 legal stuff is one way of of perhaps um, changing those kind of dominant ways that we think of gender as only binary. Like it's it's quite symbolic, it's quite significant, but it's not. I mean, it's not necessarily the sort of be all and end all for me. I mean, for me personally, but for a lot of people, I think there's a there are other kinds of ways in which society might change to be more inclusive of a range of gender identities that don't involve, you know, thinking only in terms of markers on passports and that kind of thing. But yeah, it is a problem. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. So let's <laughs> let's go that way then. So you talk about other ways which society can change, be more flexible, more ad adaptive. What, what might they be? What might um, things that either I can do personally, who's very ignorant of this topic, or just in general society can do that could be useful then? Well, I mean, if I can talk about perhaps the, the research that I've been doing about um, non-binary people in higher education, because, you know, that's the, the sphere that I work in and you work in and probably a lot of the people listening to this might work in or be students in. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of ways in which something like the university experience is, is very highly gendered, whether it's, you know, when you're a student and you come to register and enroll when you start, whether it's the way that staff address classes, you know, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, that kind of thing, um, whether it is in the, the way you teach a curriculum, and it would be actually very interesting to think about, um, you know, how that pans out in the hard sciences versus the the social sciences and the you know the examples that you use um the assumptions that you make about about the kind of material that you're talking about there's all sorts of ways in which that experience becomes very binary and it doesn't feel like there's a lot of space for um anything else and that could include also things like the, the kind of the actual the physical architecture of the university so um, how halls of residences are organized or to toilets on campus or changing rooms in the sports centers and you know all of those kinds of things and there are ways of making those every all of that practice more more inclusive to a, a range of um, gender identities by in a way, de-gendering them. So marking gender less, I think. So why why would 
toilets have to be gendered or why would all of the toilets have to be gendered or you know why do we organize things can we think about what language we use in the classroom can we ask students what pronouns they would prefer to be referred to by can we um give them other options when they register uh, so that their gender is accurate accurately um registered on their student record that kind of thing and so yeah I think all of these things are possible um, and, and doable uh, kind of right now uh, there are bigger ways in which binary gender is so entrenched in in everything that we do that are obviously going to take a lot longer to um, shift but yeah I think there's there's sort of surface practical things which can absolutely be changed and they and in in a lot of ways they have changed so yeah. yeah i think we're quite fortunate in a number of ways that we work in a university system which is sometimes quite progressive but uh to stay within the university world and talk about toilets because i want to talk about toilets today uh i'm going to start with a story uh i i did a lot of my training in auckland at uh, auckland university's medical school and it was built i forget in the 50s or 60s and it has this amazing architectural feature for a tower block and that it was only built with men's toilets because it was a medical school in the 50s. So of course they only built men's bathrooms. Why would you build women's bathrooms in a school for doctors? Which is a whole nother topic for another day perhaps. But they never retrofitted it. And so they just went through and changed the signs on every second floor to be um, from male to female. So all the female bathrooms had a line of urinals that they never tore out. It was a whole thing. It was, it was a running joke for years. But contrasting that to, uh, say, our university with Westminster, where we've had senior management come out and our, our vice chancellor of the university state say quite openly and explicitly that we're going to have gender neutral bathrooms by, I forget the exact date, and I'll look it up and find it. Now, you've done a lot of uh, work in this area. And one of the ways I actually found out about you was a video you posted on YouTube about toilets. <laughs> because we've touched on this idea of history We've touched on the idea of future, but what is it about the history of toilets that are so topical here? <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, so I, I've, I feel now that like I have a reputation as like the toilet person and <laughs> it's a bit undeserved in a sense because I, um, that video came about because I had done a conference paper um, at the, as a, um, trans youth organization called gendered intelligence that I um, do some volunteer work for and they were having a conference and they said you know can you come and do something about about toilets because obviously it's a big issue for trans people um, and it has become a kind of national debate about around you know who's allowed in the toilets I mean in the states it has been a real flashpoint and here it is you know one of the sort of rumbling on um, discussions and so I used to do a, um, a bit in a, um, one of the introductory lectures on one of my gender studies modules about how public toilets are these very kind of fraught spaces that can help us to think about how we divide things up by gender, but also how spaces are, are segregated often by kind of class and race and around sexuality and disability, as well as gender and uh, issues around like transgender versus cisgender. And so, um, yeah, so I, I, I can't claim to have ever done any kind of proper research about toilets, but I, I um, you know, it was something that I, I was also sort of have been involved at Westminster in um, trying to think about how we might make our facilities more gender neutral in terms of kind of signage and like you were saying, what, what kinds of facilities are actually in the toilets and how, they, how the space is organised and that kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in it because as well, you know, when I go to work, there's often, you know, that I think there are gender neutral toilets in most of our buildings, but they are not often in the, the most convenient places. And so I often have to find myself having to, to use the gendered toilets at work. And I don't like that. And a lot of students don't like that who are in this situation. So, um, yeah, I'm sort of personally invested, but it's also kind of a very kind of useful way of thinking about how gender sort of shapes our world um and so yeah i've forgotten your original question because i went off on a tangent but remind me 
<laughs> the w- what I was doing unsubtly was queuing you up for a bit of a bit of a history question coming. Oh, next. the history question. But, yeah. Um, so you 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 use toilets as an example of um, how we think about gender, and I, I really like that video, and I'm going to link it below um, because it was a really interesting conversation about uh, toilets and what they meant and what they represented and where they came from in European society in terms of you know, like you mentioned the idea of class and um, men's toilets versus women's toilets, because originally, why would you have women's public toilets? And then they became a thing and they had to become a protected thing because of society. But where I was cueing you towards was this original question and statement we had, was when we were talking about um, you, you and your role and all these things I want to ask you about and unpick and find, you made this point earlier that our kind of our binary view of gender was culturally and historically not unique that uh, Western culture and that right now culture. So does that mean historically there have been periods of time where gender hasn't been considered such a binary thing? Or to put another way, is this is this moment in time as we move away from uh, binary gender with things like gender neutral bathrooms and changing the way we view gender in society versus sex, have we been a flash in the pan for the past period of time? I mean, yeah, I mean, that is a really interesting question. I mean, I think, you know, historically, there have always been people who um, didn't fit the gender binary. I mean, if we're talking about um, intersex people who are, you know, that's the more sort of um, uh, sort of scientific uh, people with... um, disorders of sexual development or differences of sexual development so it's the the kind of sex side rather than the gender side although the division between sex and gender is up for debate in my opinion but um yeah then and so there's you know there are those people and then there are people who have never you know um in terms of their gender expression or their gender identity fit in both in either of the two kind of binary options. And I think, you know, a lot of that history has been erased, it has been hidden, um, it isn't it isn't well known. Um, and, you know, there are lots of cultures around the world where they have kind of third genders or fourth genders, or they have people who are sort of outside of that um, binary system. Um, and here in, you know, even in the West, if we think about the, the history of, of the kind of um, science of, sex you know there have been different models of how people have understood that over time and the one we have currently understands you know female bodies and male bodies as 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 kind of two separate species almost but there have been times in history where you know it's been about there being only kind of one model of the body and men and women definitely exist but they're sort of hierarchically up and down the model rather than two separate kind of things so I think you know these the way that we think about it now is is culturally specific um it's historically specific um and so yeah you know in in 200 years time we might be laughing at the idea that you know why why would you separate people like this why would you think there was only two of anything um or, or we might not I don't know um but yeah it's a it is a really interesting question and I think you know your example of the university building with only men's toilets is is a really perfect um example I might incorporate that back into the lecture in the future and and yeah, just because it does speak to the way in which, you know, who do you provide toilets for is people who are in that public space. And what does that tell us about who is entitled to that public space? Um, and this is why there weren't there weren't women's public toilets um, for a long time, whilst there were men's public toilets, because it, and it was a way of further in enshrining that idea that genders are very different and that women belong in the home and they could go to the toilet there and men can go out in public and you know pee everywhere they like um yeah so it's um yeah it's a, a, and and what people were angry about when when those toilets were introduced was this idea of women being out in public and women becoming kind of public property and that that was the that was the thing that, that agitated people that they didn't like it was that kind of blurring of the public and the private sphere um which was the you know the way in which those kinds of ideas about men and women as scientifically different were being reinforced kind of socially so yeah it's a it's a, it's kind of a fascinating um uh, fascinating history um which i yeah like i say can't claim to know everything about at all <laughs> um, um but yeah it's it, it, 
and we're, we're now at a point where it's sort of playing out around a different set of issues um, uh, and, and quite kind of contentiously so in some cases, yeah. So what do you think of the different sets of issues? What do you think is going to be the next set of issues? Where are we going <laughs> with this? Oh, Lord. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's a very difficult, I think it's a, a, a difficult area. And I think, I think we're going to, and my feeling is that we're going to go through a phase where there's a sort of third toilet that's the gender neutral toilet before we can move through into a time when perhaps we don't need to gender toilet spaces at all. Or we can, and we can think about, you know, I'm, I'm really fascinated as to why the, why public toilets are so kind of communal and uh, and yet thought of as kind of private spaces at the same time and why we think that separating them by gender you know retains that sense of privacy but if we mix the genders they somehow become not private I do, you know that and there's all sorts of reasons why maybe we do need some gender segregated toilets um but I, you know, I'm kind of interested in like, how, how did we get to this point where these things have become such sort of truths that people really want to hold on to and they feel terribly, terribly kind of afraid and threatened when those things are, you know, come under, under consideration. Yeah, and that's kind of what I'm fascinated by. So you, you touched on a point there that I, I maybe reconsider, we should have started at this, started with, excuse me, at the start. And you touched on this idea of a division between sex and gender. And I'm going to put my scientist hat back on for a second. And when I talk to my students, I talk about uh, gender and sex. And, I'm, and we use the term quite explicitly and very precisely in the life sciences. But for you, when you use this term and you differentiate them, what are we talking about here? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I've actually been teaching this very recently, so it's, it's all fresh in my head. But um, yeah, so I mean, I, you know, we, 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 we often draw a distinction between sex as the sort of biological, anatomical chromosomes, hormones, genes, brains, whatever it is that we're thinking is somehow sex is located in those, those facets and then gender as a kind of social manifestation of that which is much more um culturally changeable and specific and you know we've all we all know that gender roles change all the time and gender expectations change all the time and that's gender and it's social um but i think um you know so there's a, a sort of um branch of uh feminist theory that that's questioning the the sort of um not the validity of sex, but the the kind of way in which it's seen as sort of outside of culture or beyond culture or beyond society, and actually thinking, well, aren't the you know the the gendered ideas that we are we are sort of mired in, what what impact have they had on the ways that people have interpreted those um, things that we see that are different about different kinds of bodies and. You know, it's interesting to think about where is sex in the in the body if we're thinking about it in that way. Is it in genitals? Is it in chromosomes? Why is any one part of the body about sex and, and other parts are not about sex? Humans have lots of different hair colours, for example, but we don't think that is part of sex. Like what it's a it's a kind of um it's not about sort of denying the fact that there are obviously different parts of the body and people have different bodies, but it's about asking, well, what, you know, what, what went into dividing them up in this kind of a way? And then, you know, even if there are these two sexed bodies, why would that ever mean that that has to translate directly into two distinct gender categories so yeah there's a lot of questions to ask I think about that and a lot you know lots of people have asked that and I think there's some really interesting work in kind of feminist biology um people like Anne Fausto Sterling for example who have, have tried to kind of complexify this idea that sex is quite kind of straightforward and objective and natural and we can't really do anything about it um which is in, you know, within the social sciences is very much like, okay, well, we don't understand that science stuff. So it must be true. Let's just leave it as it is and concentrate on the social stuff. But I think actually there's a lot, a, a lot of other ways that we might be thinking about it. Yeah. 
I'm going to put my scientist hat back on for a second now again, because <laughs> we teach, um, I teach a class called medical physiology, where we give the students this uh, 400 word description of a, a medical case study, and then they have to try and uh, understand it and do a lot of research and, and pick it apart. And then they have to write summaries of it. And it's a really intense class that the students really enjoy, but it's a lot of work. And of our um, rotation of case studies, we had one this year that was an intersex individual who was um, diagnosed at, uh, I can't remember the exact details, but about 16 or 17 as being um, uh, genetically a male, but she was anatomically and physically female. And it was a really interesting case study for the students to write up because it was the only one they got that wasn't just the, what you call the hard science, the pure, the science over there doing this stuff. And that was, um, it actually had sociological aspects to it and they had to consider, uh, you know, this person's hopes and dreams and aspirations as they are suggesting treatment options. And they find, found it the most interesting. I didn't expect that, I've got to admit. There was no genes and receptors and cellular signaling pathways. This one was a, well, you could do this option or you could do this option. Let's talk about what that's going to mean for someone because it was very much a sex versus gender uh, case study. So it's really interesting, really interesting to, to think about from uh, that point of view. And then to leave my science hat on for a, a bit more, which is very unusual for me in this podcast, I'm sure I, I should stop saying that. Uh, there's another aspect of your work that we haven't really touched on yet. And I want to uh, talk to you about how this overlaps. You talk about fat a lot, about representation mm. of fat in the media, about um, uh, fat in society. And then you, you cross your work over as well. And so you talk about trans and fat and uh, have a Venn diagram of those two things together. So what's this type of your, this type of, good job, Brad. What's this part of your research about? What's this, uh, what's the story of this work? Yeah, well, I think, um, so I've, yeah, I've come from, there is a field of fat studies, which is this sort of, um, the, the study of fat as as a kind of social construction yeah so it is it's not it's not medical science and it but it's understanding the the sort of lived experience of fat people and especially the ways in which that is actually you know that fat people are subject to all sorts of kinds of fat phobia and discrimination on the basis of those things um but also yeah understanding more more broadly you know what, how are fat people represented in media why is it always so negative and horrible um what are fat people's experiences of you know work and sex and all sorts of things and so yeah i, I you know i'm really interested in um the ways in which fat is gendered but also then how gender is sort of fatted, I guess, like, you know, so I, it, it, I was thinking about, you know, the ways in which um, a lot of kind of weight loss discourses talk about things like, you know, people not feeling feminine when they're fat, if they are, if they're, if they want to feel feminine, or not feeling masculine as well, when they're fat, um, it, you know, for, for people who identify as male, fatness rounds out the body in ways that are kind of feminizing. And ironically, for people who are, uh, identify as female, um, it, it, it sort of gives them a bulk which is unfeminine. So it, it, gender and fat are doing something strange together, and I'm not quite sure what it is still. Um, but yeah, but it's definitely there's a there's a kind of intersection there. And I was, yeah, I was specifically interested in. Um, the experiences of fat trans people and what what role fat played in their kinds of transitions and the types of changes that they might want to or not want to make to their bodies and how how fat um what kind of role it played in how other people read their gender because i think it's you know we have a kind of idea about where fat has to be located on the body um so the there are you know we I think we even refer to it as kind of male pattern fatness and, and female fat and fatness and yeah so I was just interested in those kinds of things and I think there's a lot going on around that and uh, you know what I was finding was that a lot of the work in fat studies was really about cisgendered women and their embodiment and their lived experiences and their problems basically which are many and legitimately require study and then in trans studies 
um, this discussion about bodies was much more about um, you know kind of surgeries and genitals and and that kind of thing and and I was like well those those genitals are actually attached to uh, to the rest of the body what's going on in the rest of the body and you do get a lot you know a bit of chat about if you know if people go on hormones to transition then if they do cause factors sort of redistribute around the body but no I, I couldn't there wasn't a lot of um kind of academic work about how people felt about that or what it meant or what it meant if you were fat as to when you if you were thin um so yeah I was those were the things that I was kind of interested in in um I always say fleshing out which is just the the most obvious and cringy metaphor but that yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're right it's one of those things where you you say that like, yep I just said fleshing out when talking I did it about again that. yeah <laughs> but I know what you mean I mean I know exactly the line that I would use when I'm teaching uh phenotype body shape and masculinization and feminization of fat patterning and so I can see where you're coming from in terms of uh fat patterns and people thinking about how that makes me look and feel what so that's a, an entire field that I hadn't thought about which I guess is why you're researching it because that makes a niche which needs to be done <laughs> which is fantastic so interesting unfortunately I think that's probably all we have time for today but uh, it only leads me to say thank you to uh, Francis Ray White for being here today just because I want to use the full name the full title yeah <laughs> thank you for having me it's been great yeah uh, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation and if you did enjoy listening to our podcast, then feel free to subscribe, whether or not you're watching along on YouTube or listening on to the audio version on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts. My name's Bradley Elliott, and this has been this week's Different Conversation.